of the health scrutiny panel. Um, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. Please ensure you turn it on when you're speaking, turn it off when you are finished, and it's just the big button in the middle. If it's not glowing red, it's off. Um, we will take all the reports uh, that have been published to the agenda as read by members of the panel, so we'll move as swiftly as we can to, uh, to questions. Um, for item number one, apologies for absence. I've had apologies from Councillor St. Matthew Daniel um, and apologies for lateness from Council, uh, Councillor Bauer, who should be joining us, I'm hoping, by about seven o'clock. Um, we also possibly have Councillor Hepzibah Olumbegbe joining us um, for the final item on the suicide prevention strategy, of which she has a certain uh, expertise and contributions to make. Um, do I have any other apologies? No, thank you. Any urgent business? I see none. And declarations of interest I have one to make. Um, in my professional role at Health for Heroes, I advised councils on veterans and suicide risk, and so I've worked with the council around that particular section of the suicide prevention strategy. Um, do I have any other declarations of interest? Councillor Backen. NHS member of staff. Thank you. I see no others. We'll move on. Okay, so um, if I hand over to Neil Kennick-Brown, who's the Chief Operating Officer, um, for an update on the Eltham Community Hospital. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's been a great opportunity to uh, come to you today uh, and give you an update on the uh, Eltham Community Hospital, in particular uh, the work going on there around the development of the Community Diagnostic Centre. Um, I've got two colleagues here with me who are going to lead on the presentation because uh, one of the exciting things about this development is very much being um, led by our local hospital trust, um, Lucian Granite Trust. So uh, we've got uh, Natasha Crawford um, and Duncan Stamp who are going to uh, kind of present to you. Um, I've also got a, uh, the chair highlighted a question that she had relating to what happens with the Eltham Community Hospital intermediate care beds. Um, and I've got a couple of slides which I will update um, on that um, afterwards. But I suggest we go into the main body of the presentation, so over to uh, Natasha. Great, thank you. Lovely to meet you all. And thank you for the opportunity this evening to give you an update on all of the fantastic work we're doing over at Eltham. So, I wanted to start then just with a little bit about the programme context for colleagues that may not be um, as familiar. So the central aims of the programme, as set out nationally by NHS England, are to improve population health outcomes and shift the dial on health inequalities. And we will do that and achieve that through easy access to diagnostic care for populations, particularly with those with the greatest need and least access. Now, we do know that patients living in South East London have been poorly served historically. They have more limited access to diagnostic capacity. We know across Greenwich, historically, imaging rates per 100,000 have been much lower than elsewhere across South East London. We also know that Greenwich is in the uh, top 15% of most deprived areas nationally, similarly have a high BAME population of around 38%, I believe, again, where these groups have disproportionate outcomes, poorer health, poorer health outcomes. So as, as Neil outlined a moment ago, Lewis and Greenwich Trust, LGT, we are hosting two CDCs in London, in, in South East London. So there are two in South East London, LGT is hosting both. So tonight we'll be focused on Eltham Community Hospital, so the community, um, community Diagnostic Centre there, but just to note that we do have a smaller spoke CDC to complement the main hub at Eltham, and that is over at Queen Mary's in Sidcup. So a little bit about the programme. As, as we said, it's led by LGT, so we do have a robust programme governance structure in place, but of course we're working with partners from across the system to deliver the programme. So working with our partners at GSTT and KCH, but also at place level as well, and all the key stakeholder groups that we need to engage with. Importantly, CDCs are a system-wide offer, so while LGT is leading the programme on behalf of South East London, it is a system-wide provision. Move on to the next slide. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, I think we may have jumped one. Got a little ahead of ourselves, thank you. So Eltham, it, is a main, it meets the definition of a main hub, CDC. Um, as colleagues will be aware, it is located at Eltham Community Hospital, 
and importantly, is easily accessible by public transport. As I said, the CDC programme is intended to support uh, the population across South East London. So we have Elton train station that's around a 10 minute walk that serves over the west side of South East London via Lewisham on the train line. But we also have very good public transport links. Um, the community hospital sits just behind the high street. So lots of, uh, lots of good bus routes linking through to Kidbrook, Greenwich, Mottingham and sort of south, south of that as well. It is additional capacity for the system. So once fully operational, Elton will offer circa 100,000 additional tests on an annual basis. And this, these are, as I said, to patients residing across South East London. This is across imaging, physiological sciences and pathology. And what you can see outlined in your slides there are just the numbers that we will set to achieve on an annual basis across those different modalities. We move on to the next slide, thank you. So we're delighted that the CDC is already partially operational. We were really keen, as we said, there's a, a real need in the system for the Community Diagnostic Centre, particularly in and around Greenwich and, and to support Eltham and the local population. So the CDC will be delivered in two phases. So we were keen to make use of the space that we already have there and to get going as soon as we could. So in the interim, on the first floor of the building, we've stood up some of our modalities already, particularly around phlebotomy. So we got going with phlebotomy in March of this year, soon after followed by ultrasound in May, and then more recently in September, we had respiratory and telederm, and then cardiology in the new year, albeit on a smaller scale. And that's in, that's in an interim um, space or demise on the first floor. As we said, it's an interim solution, but we were really keen to get going as soon as we could. What colleagues will see on, on the slides there, and we also have much larger versions of the floor plans behind me, which we can share, is there is a significant construction program. That will, the first shovel has gone in the ground at the end of November, so it's a really key milestone for the program. And what that means is over the next 12 months, that construction program will be focused on the ground floor. And so when we are fully operational and we go live in early 2025, we will have additional provision for the CT, MRI and the X-ray, in addition to those services that I've already described, and they will all be located on the ground floor. From a patient experience perspective, it, it's really beneficial to have those services in one place. It's the, the layout, lots of work has gone into the layout and the demise and, and how patients will navigate that. We've done a lot of work particularly focused on the patient experience and the flow through the building. And so hopefully that's reflected in the slides there. And of course to say that we won't be the only uh, tenants in the building and, and other tenants are there and will continue to be so. But the CDC will take up most of the ground floor once we're operational. As I mentioned, we're delighted of all the work and the key work that we've achieved to date and that we are already live and we're able to support patients already with timely access to diagnostics. So since we launched in March, we have delivered an additional 21,000 tests to the system, so really fantastic. Importantly, that capacity that we do have has been really well utilized to date. And you can see on the slides and the screen there, particularly in ultrasound. So we had agreed activity for the system. We have now surpassed that in ultrasound. There's been that real demand for that capacity. But similarly, in phlebotomy and some elements of respiratory as well. As I mentioned, the first shovel went in the ground in November. So that was a really key milestone for the program overall. So we have completed all of that planning and design phase. And as I said, construction now underway. While there are challenges to recruitment, we have managed to successfully recruit 15 staff to the CDC to date across both clinical and non-clinical roles, including in really challenging areas to recruit to, such as respiratory. We know that other CDCs have had challenges with that, so we've been really lucky to, and really fortunate to be able to get those roles in post in a timely manner. Finally, the next 12 months ahead of us, lots to do, lots, lots achieved, but lots still to do. So work is underway to develop appropriate referral pathways. So how, how are patients referred into the CDC and what are those pathways? 
and of course a, a critical dependency there or a key part of that is those supporting digital solutions or enablers and that will therefore enable both GPs, so for GP direct access to refer their patients into the, the diagnostic centre, but also working with our colleagues at GSTT and KCH to ensure that we've got those robust pathways in place. So as I said, work is underway on that already and, and happy to speak to that in more detail as, as necessary. Finally, as I said, we're delighted that we've recruited 15 staff to date. Um, the CDC, however, will require 75 staff on a whole time basis, so there's a, a big challenge ahead of us over the next 12 months to recruit those remaining 60 colleagues across those different modalities. Again, work is already underway on that to ensure that LGT can attract those staff and through a number of routes. So we as a trust have a really strong and positive track record with international recruitment, um, particularly in radiography, but indeed across other areas in, in the trust. And so we'll be looking at that. We have very low turnover among our international recruits, a really stable workforce. Of course, we'll be looking to complement that with traditional recruitment strategies, but also thinking about the opportunities and how we maximize them for the CDC. So targeting new graduate cohorts, the trainee posts that the CDC might offer and that training pipeline and development. And so again, we're working with our colleagues from across the pr provider collaborative, across the system, to work out how can we best recruit and sort of recruit to 60 staff that we need to and how can we do that effectively over the 12 months ahead working with our system partners. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you happy for us to move straight to questions? Yeah, I think if you move to questions and then I, I think we do the intermediate care bit as a re in response to that, because I think the main focus is on these guys and the work on the CDC. Um, yes, we're happy to take it that way around. Um, just to say there's a slight presentation coming on the intimate care beds situation, which we reviewed last year. Okay, um, councillors, Councillor Backen. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just have two questions, if that's okay. One of which I think I already asked last year, so I apologize. Um, my question, um, my first question is about, obviously I know it hasn't started yet, but the MRI and CT um, reporting and whether this is all additional capacity, and that's great, but whether there will be delays in actually reporting of the imaging, because I know that's currently a challenge within the NHS, particularly in some specific areas. So I was just wondering in terms of whether you'd have lots and lots of patients going to get their scans, which is brilliant, but then waiting for long periods of time for them to be reported and how that um, is going to be, um, be dealt with. And my second um, question, if that's okay, um, it's just about whether these staff are directly employed by the NHS or whether they're contracted out to, to other companies. Thank you. Or other providers. Brilliant. Thank you for both of your questions. So in regards to the first one, we have built in as part of our workforce model consultant radiologists to meet that reporting um, element of the programme. We are also looking at how we maximise the innovative solutions for, within the NHS workforce. And so we are also looking at and exploring reporting radiographer roles, but we have included that in the programme overall. So the CDC workforce will include diagnostic through to reporting provision. Thank you. I think the second question was around um, whether we'd be recruiting directly or um, with external partners. So absolutely the intention is to recruit uh, LGT staff. And there's real benefit in that, we hope, in that, we, of course, we have a large workforce in, on our acute sites, particularly at the QE, um, and all that skill base. So we're hoping to add to that skill base, have rotational roles that can rotate between sites in time. So you're really having that kind of fertilization of skills between sites. Um, we need to be realistic as well. Uh, so we've got, a, as Natasha said, we've got a tough task in recruiting those staff. So of course, much like uh, in the acute sites, we have to be aware that we may need to have some agency staff within that uh, and build those relationships with external partners. So. We're, we're confident and we're really determined that this will be LGT-led, LGT staff. 
but we've got to be realistic around some of the options. So that's still part of the work that we're doing over the next 12 months and looking at all those options. Um, and we've, in terms of the business case, the bid and the, the financial side of this, we have costed in that kind of agency premium so that you know, we can make sure we balance uh, within the, the kind of funds that we've got. Thank you. Councillor Fahey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, perhaps I should declare an interest because I've used the service uh, on a number of occasions and I think it's uh, fantastic and the, the staff are uh, simply great, really. Um, welcome, and, uh, welcome some thoughts from you on the governance structure uh, and how that operates. Uh, I'd also be interested in, although you highlight in, uh, on page nine, a significant number of people using the service um, and obviously that will grow. So what in, in effect is, is the geographical spread uh, of the service? You talk about South East London, but does that end, uh, does, start to, does that start and end somewhere? Uh, that would be uh, extremely uh, useful. Thanks very much. Should I take the second, you take the first? Do you want to kick off on the yeah. first? Uh, so governance structures, yes. Yeah. So, um, I suppose there's, there's two sides to the governance in terms of there's the governance we've got now in uh, implementing the programme uh, and uh, there's the governance that comes as we kind of get into the business as usual um, following kind of launch proper if you like. So as we've said we're in phase one but there's phase two to come and, and then we'll get to into 2025. Hopefully everything will be very smooth and lots of activity. So um, at the moment lots of external partners involved, sorry, well numerous stakeholders in terms of the landlords of the building and uh, of the tenants, but also the architects and the construction company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, in terms of our structures, then we have a monthly program board uh, with a number of sub subgroups that uh, work into that. So we have, for example, work streams around the estate and digital aspects of things. We've got the financial work streams and we've got workforce work streams. Um, and within that, then, of course, there's all the, um, there are subgroups in that and, and uh, you know, a large number of people that are working along those kind of governance principles. Um, so they're the structures that we've put in place to kind of deliver. But, um, of course, as we get towards BAU, then we do have this governance with LGT. So, of course, the, and, and maybe where you're going with this is the kind of governance in terms of... Um, uh, practice and within radiology uh, and filtering into our divisional governance programs and trust governance, um, which of course we have that benefit from being at the, within the trust. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether there's anything, governance is a large subject of course, or whether there's anything particularly you're interested in. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, and yes, thank you for the presentation uh, and uh, such a welcome addition to the kind of health ecosystem. It's great to have a progress report. Um, so I've got two questions, both really about scaling up. So you, it looks from the figures you've given here, you kind of about, you know, 30-ish percent of, of, uh, of your full capacity, 21,000 since, uh, tests since March. Um, as you scale up, you know, can we expect the utilisation rate to stay that high? or will it fall? Um, and secondly, kind of related question, what's at the top of your risk register as you, as you mobilize fully? So happy to pick those questions up, but also noting there was a, a second question from your colleague that we, we also didn't cover. So shall I start there? Um, so in terms of the geographical spread of patients, the, the CDC is, is a system-wide provision, and what we mean by that is across the ICB, so the six boroughs, essentially, so Lewisham, Greenwich, et cetera, through to Bexley, et cetera. We, we are on a journey with that, and we also recognize that geographically where Eltham is located, it will naturally be easier for some patients living across southeast London to access than others. If we think about our colleagues who live, um, our patients who live over in Lambeth and Southwark, et cetera, it, Eltham isn't on their doorstep in the way that it is for patients who live in Greenwich. We recognize that. There is also a dependency or a critical step here around those digital solutions that I mentioned. So presently, 
The phlebotomy, as an example, is GP direct access. So GPs in the three boroughs, our three LGT, our three boroughs for Lew around Lewisham, they can refer in, but over time we will expand that. And that, again, cr critical dependencies there in digital solutions, one of which to enable GPs across all six boroughs to refer will be introduced in March as part of the South East London wide digital roadmap. So the, the thing I wanted to, to note around the geographical sp spread is it's once we are fully operational and once those critical digital dependencies and enablers are in place, it will be, as a provision, open to patients living across all of those boroughs. Um, we are on a journey towards that. We have GP direct access at the moment for phlebotomy only, whereas we're, it is Lewisham patients at the moment who are using it for ultrasound. As I said, the digital solutions are the critical step here, but we have that roadmap and we are working towards that, and those will be in place once the CDC is operational or fully live next March. In terms of the next two questions then, so in terms of the scaling up, yes, as, as you said, it's been well utilized at present, which is fantastic, really great to see. Do we expect it to still be well used? Yes, based on the system data at the moment. And I wonder, Duncan, if you wanted to speak to that, sort of that broader perspective that you have on, on the system. There's a kind of, there's a guiding principle behind this, isn't there, that actually, um, the system requires more capacity, and uh, we've done lots of work on that. These, some of these questions aren't simple, actually, in terms of the demand capacity piece. Uh, so it's never quite done and dusted in terms of making sure that these things balance, and we're continuing to work on it, particularly since we've also, um, you know, bringing in a spoke at uh, QMS. So it's not a completed question. But across South East London, um, if, you, if you look even operationally now, there's a real deficit, and actually some of the conversations we're having with our system partners is around mutual aid, for example, across South East London, um, with um, in some places quite significant weights for uh, imaging particularly, uh, but not exclusive to imaging. So um, all the indications are that this will be really well utilised. I think our real challenge will be making sure that it's you know, it's really um, meeting the need of the local population and it's, it's improving access. Uh, we've got some questions still around how far people might travel, you know, and practically, actually you're going to travel from Lambeth, Lambeth to here. Um, and so invariably we expect it to be used by the local population. But um, in essence, yes, we, we think we'll... Uh, and, and another key thing operationally that we'll want to do is that this should be additional resource and... Um, it's, it's making it timely then. What we don't necessarily want it to do is become another resource where you've got big long waits. Uh, that's easier said than done. So there's something around how we um, kind of release that capacity in such a way that you can get that quick turnaround and maintain it. Can I just, just very quickly chip in? So I guess for, as a Greenwich councillor, the main thing you want is to benefit Greenwich residents. So I think one of the things we really championed from a kind of a local perspective was to get the ECDC in Greenwich and in, in, in Elton. So I think that's that's delight. Obviously, we want other boroughs to benefit, but I guess the key thing is to recognise that we knew that there was quite a gap in the diagnostic capability or capacity, sorry, in the borough, and that's something we really wanted to address. So I think um, it will definitely really help our population, and we know that there was less access uh, for our population, but there hopefully be a knock-on benefit. And then just to kind of um, explain that digital front door bit so essentially is to try and enable patient choice so if you're going in the future you'll be able to log on and you would just see where there were slots available so for some people go well um, my you know my mum lives in Eltham I'll go there and you know so it's it's much more enabling people's choice and the availability that's there so for some people it will work uh, well um, and I guess that's part of the the, the approach going forward and then the, the team are also working really hard with our local GPs about starting to build those pathways because they're, we can do some real opportunities there both within the very local Eltham and the primary care network but also more widely across the borough.
Thank you. And I think your second question around our risk register and what is top of the list, I think it's fair to say recruitment is a challenge, workforce challenges as echoed and seen elsewhere across the NHS more broadly. We have had challenges particularly in cardiology. That being said, we are working with colleagues across the system to look at, again, those innovative solutions and how we might use the CDC as a training opportunity to build up that workforce in that space. But um, Duncan, I don't know if you had any other views, but in my view, it's recruitment is our, our challenge. You know, I wrote the, wrote the same thing down, so um, definitely. And, and, but again, there's real opportunity, and, and then <laughs> that's easy to say, but there's a, there's a big task, but actually there's plenty of opportunity for new ways of working, flexible working. We talked about reporting earlier, didn't we? So looking at radiographers, for example, reporting radiographers, which is something that's growing on the acute sites. So um, there's an opportunity for, for innovation here, so a big task, but also an opportunity to really look at things slightly differently. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention on the previous question around utilisation was, uh, and the digital piece, again, we're at this real kind of crossroads, I think, that digital is now coming, it's kind of here, and um, our phlebotomy services are one example of that, where patients can go online, they can book their appointment online, they can choose where they want to be seen, and invariably if they live local to Elton, that's where they choose. Um, and there's some fantastic system money to facilitate some of this so and to grow that ele kind of electrical, that's not the right word, is it, but that uh, technological um, opportunity. So we'll have those online platforms in time for phlebotomy, but also for those other services at the, uh, at the CDC. Councillor Rahman. Thank you, Chair, and uh, my apologies for uh, ar arriving slightly late. I do apologise. Um, actually, I was going to ask about your challenges around recruitment, so you've kind of pretty much answered that um, and, and how you want to get around that using technology as well. I think the main thing that I want to ask about is around the workforce and what are you doing to obviously promote internally, so obviously from other local trusts where someone might be looking for an opportunity kind of to develop themselves. And you mentioned about providing training as well. Um, but in those non-clinical roles, how much are we doing to kind of recruit locally, basically? Thank you. It, it's a really interesting question. Um, as, as we said, we, we know and recognize those, those recruitment challenges, but as Duncan says, also the opportunities within that. So in terms of the training, we have a program of work at LGT that's looking at the training, training and development pipeline for the, those cohorts that we have, so our established workforce. We have a really good track record with that. We just recently have a, we've had a cohort of band fives who are stepped into band six roles, and so it's building on that, and I'm sure Duncan might want to speak to that in a moment. I think it's a really good point about your non-clinical roles and recruiting from the local population. In fact, our receptionist at the CDC lives two minutes down the road. She loves working there. It's really local to her. And actually, that's something we can take away and think a little bit about a bit more. We have our usual press campaigns or recruitment campaigns, should we say, via Twitter, et cetera, across the trust more broadly. But I think you're right. I think there's an opportunity to really focus on the local population for, for those roles in particular. So really, really welcome that feedback. Thank you. And Duncan, I don't know if you wanted to speak to the wider work that Dan Weston's leading. Yeah, again, it's um, times are changing in terms of how we approach these things, I think, because of the, some of the challenges we've faced. So one thing that LGT do now have is um, much better um, resourcing into workforce strategies. And so we, uh, um, the, the gentleman that Natasha referencing, Dan Weston, is uh, an AHP workforce lead, for example. Um, so now we've got, really got some resources looking at things like international recruitment, looking at uh, new roles, looking at um, training and, and preceptorship programs. So how do you actually particularly take hopefully local people and, and skill them up into roles that um, you know that are useful for the and and that promote that kind of talent so increasingly we're finding that people move around more it's a much more agile workforce these days isn't it and actually you see that in some of these professions in that people don't stay as long anymore because they go, and, and we have that locally here, I'm sure you're probably aware that people tend to start, we, we track people in, but then they might move to some of our big partners for more specialist roles. So how can you create some of these novel pathways that actually are interesting? 
um, but also how do you retain people? And I think one of those ways is to have training programs, you know, to recruit band five radiographers, but then have a, you know, a swift way to train them up to band six and, and then hopefully retain them in roles. For example, like I was saying around rotational roles that might move, uh, we, we're not really seeing that people would just, would only work at the CDC. They might work there for six months and then move to QE and they might rotate back and start to get different skills. Um, but yeah, all ideas on the table really. But uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting space actually. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fahey. Just a supplementary uh, chair, if I might. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm feeling dim this evening, but am I correct in assuming that the, this is the main hub covering uh, six boroughs? So therefore somebody from Lambeth or somebody from Bromley or wherever uh, could have access to uh, the provision. So uh, therefore, that's a significant population. So therefore, what are the other hubs that exist within the South East London family? Um, and the final point I wanted to make, in this context, obviously it's going to grow. Um, what's the likely waiting times? Um, or is that something that you're reviewing as you go along? Thank you. So, so yes, in regards to Eltham as a main hub CDC, it will be open to patients, to the population across all six boroughs in South East London. In regards to other CDCs across the patch, so Eltham as a main hub will be one of two CDCs in South London, with the second CDC in Sidcup at Queen Mary's. Now, that is a smaller CDC. It's a spoke to complement Eltham, so fewer modalities with a principal focus on imaging. So it will have a CT, MRI, X-ray, and then phlebotomy, where we already have a provision there, LGT does. Um, so two CDCs open and available to, all, to, to the population across all six boroughs. In terms of the waiting lists, I think as Duncan mentioned a moment ago, it is in part work, it, it's something we're working through as part of the program development at this stage. I think there are a number of ways we could cut the cake. Do we allow an equal allocation to the different providers across South East London? Do you open that capacity at, at the CDC at Eltham with a focus for those providers with the longest back, with the longest waiting list or the greatest backlogs? And so those are conversations and questions that we are working through presently that we need to answer. Again, I think as Duncan mentioned a moment ago, we really want it to be a focus on timely access. Um, and so we don't want to introduce these CDCs that then wind up having these significant backlogs as we perhaps see elsewhere across the system. So it's really thinking, how do we establish the CD? How, how do we set it up in a way that it is that timely access and that that is available to patients on an equitable basis as well? And we need to think through that in a lot of detail. But of course, there is a, a lived reality that the CDC will be more, maybe more accessible for, pay, for the population who live in Greenwich, who live closer to Eltham, and indeed those who live in Bexley, QMS will be more accessible to them. And so we do need to think about those patients and the population who live in Southwark, in Lambeth, et cetera, and actually what we can do to support and enable them to make use of this provision, because we really want to focus on reducing health inequalities and improving that access overall. But just to clarify that all of our hospital sites have these, these are not diagnostics that only sit in Elton, just to say, you know, so QE also has these uh, diagnostics on their site. So this is, this is about additional capacity in the community that's not attached to a large acute hospital. So obviously we know that there are large acute hospitals at King's and at, at, at Guys and Sommies and others. So part of this is about rebalancing where some of that capacity sits. So just to see it is in the capacity, the capacity in the context of the whole. Yeah, and just very briefly to add to that, and you know, th this is a great resource, I think, for the local area. and. Um, but one of the national aspirations is around innovative pathways as well. So one thing that we'll be really looking to grow on as we, you know, at the moment we're in a phase of construction and, you know, getting things going. But in time, we're really looking for things like straight to test pathways. So, for example, it might be as an example that um, a patient with suspected lung cancer comes into the uh, CDC locally and go straight to CT tests, for example, but they've also got access, uh, um, access to x-ray and phlebotomy. So we, so we work towards pathways where someone can come in the front door, 
get a number of tests and come out the other side without hopefully having to touch an acute trust, potentially. Um, they're aspirations and they're all innovations, but there's an expectation on us to deliver those sorts of pathways, which I would see working best for local people, you know. So it's, um, but yeah, these are all things that we're, we're working through. Okay, um, two questions from me. So, Elton uh, Community Hospital's got a great location in terms of the PTEL rating and proximity and lots of buses. Um, however, we're expecting 100,000 additional people or people are driving at those visits. Um, what is the additional parking facilities? Some of them, many of them will be coming by car and impact on the local roads of an extra 100,000 visits. And also, secondly, um, what are we doing at the moment around capturing patient experience and feedback on the 21,000 visits that have already occurred to the parts of it that are operational? And have we unearthed any particular teething problems so far? Great, thank you for, for those questions. Happy to take those. So in regards to the parking provision, we do know that that is a challenge that Elton Community Hospital, I'm sure colleagues here will be aware, doesn't have an abundance of on-site parking. Um, so we know that patients are, often patients are dropped off via taxi. We have the bays on, on, on the side of the building that patients and taxis can make use of. Otherwise, we know that patients can use the pay and display on the roads, um, on Passy, Passy, Passy Place and the surrounding roads, or indeed the large Sainsbury's car park that is opposite Elton Community Hospital. I think the... As we've spoken to previously, there has been a real under, under provision in the area, and so Elton Community Hospital was a fantastic location, but noting that parking provision is limited. That being said, also thinking about sort of the green strategies more widely and how we want to be encouraging patients to be using public transport means. Um, and so actually I would say that it's in line with that. Um, in terms of your second question, we're actually in the process of standing up a patient experience piece. So with effect from the 29th of January, we have, we'll be setting up uh, QR codes. So when a patient comes in to their CDC for an appointment, there'll be a number of posters dotted around that say, that, please tell us how we've done today. They've just got to click on there with the QR code on, on their smartphone, and that will take them through to a survey that they can populate. It, it's something called evidence-based design, so it's really asking patients how they felt during their experience in the CDC. In terms of digital inclusion, of course, we know that we can't only have a digital solution for, for patients sharing that feedback. So we do also have paper copies of surveys, and we have a process in place where we'll be reviewing all of that feedback on a fortnightly basis. Of course, we've been operational for a number of months now, and so we do have feedback that's, that patients often share with staff directly, and we have a weekly mobilization meeting where any challenges are raised. Um, we, we have had some challenges, particularly around signage in the building. Um, as I said, it's an interim solution on the first floor at the moment. And so we have had historically some challenges with patients navigating and wayfinding to make their way up to the first floor. And so those were improvements or actionable um, actionable issues that, yeah, issues we could action. And so we've improved the signage in the building, as an example, in response to patient feedback. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions from councillors? Okay, uh, Neil, do you want to speak to the intermediate care beds? Yeah, certainly. Um, thank you. Um, uh, the chair kind of contacted me and, and said one of the questions was, well, what happened to the intermediate care beds and, and how's that going? So um, I gave an update a, a while back, but essentially in October 22, um, the intermediate care beds that were on uh, the Eltham a community hospital site uh, closed and those beds um, and the staff associated with them moved over to Meadowview which is the award on the Queen Mary Sidcup site. So um, a award in uh, Bexley that was uh, Queen Mary's uh, Sidcup which was historically just serving the Bexley population was then proposed to serve both the Bexley and the Greenwich population. Um, um, I must say it's been a success. So there are two kind of key things uh, for that. So first of all is we had low utilisation across both. So therefore we had inefficiency across both. So, uh, but what might you might think, well, 
you've moved two boroughs together, why did 77% not go to sort of 110% and over capacity, but only actually ended up going to 85%. In fact, even in the last few weeks, um, the Meadowview Ward has actually been able to provide some support to some Bromley residents. Um, and, and that's because basically we've reduced the length of stay in the unit, and that's because we've become a more efficient service by having the staff all working together. But also here in Greenwich, we've invested in something called our discharge to assess beds. So these are uh, ten, there are 10 beds at Charlton Park uh, Care Home, which are part of our Home First programme. So this is where someone may be in a hospital bed, someone might go, well, we think, you know, this individual needs to go into a long-term kind of nursing home placement or whatever. Well, what we don't, we say is, well, we're not going to make that decision now. And historically, they might have gone to an intermediate care bed, but actually they didn't need intermediate care. They didn't need that active kind of rehabilitation. But they go into a discharge to assess bed, um, they're supported there, and it's in that location you make the right decision. And often you find when, you've got, when you're not in a kind of an acute hospital environment and you're in a much more homely environment, uh, albeit it is a care home, that often people recover and a very high rate of those people go back home. Some of them do need care packages, but their care packages are minimized to maximize um, kind of people's own independence. So that's really helped. Um, and so we didn't need to use what we used to previously use with the um, Eltham community beds was kind of a flex category, hospital under pressure. There were beds at Eltham. There was always this demand to say, well, let's just put them in Eltham, which kind of you can understand when you're in the hospital side, but actually, when you were running an intermediate care unit, it often meant they had people and patients coming, stroke individuals coming, who didn't really need the facilities there, but they were just didn't need to be on the hospital site. And we've now managed to keep them in Greenwich, but at that discharge to assess um, beds. Um, so I've highlighted the improvements in our kind of rehabilitation nursing support, so the length of stay has reduced. We've also increased um, our capacity for double-handed patients, so that's up to 20 now. So previously it was only around 10. So this is some of the more complicated people who actually need two people uh, to, to move them, so we've managed, and that's obviously part of the staffing uh, mix that's there. And then one of the big questions was around driving, you know, it's a further way. Well, we have got this drive, voluntary driver service, there's a leaflet, etc., cetera, um, and, and so people do use that service, but we understand that the use has actually been quite low, but that service is still available um, and promoted. Um, we've seen definitely improved um, patient and carer feedback uh, throughout this. Um, we've got a really, uh, got a, a great improvement rating, which is brilliant in terms of an internal uh, Oxley's review, um, and also they actually won uh, a big directorate recognition award for all the enhancements they've made. So we're really pr pleased, actually, with how it's gone. Um, I'm very happy to show this group um, Meadowview if you want to come and visit and want to come meet with people. I'm also very happy, um, you know, subject to not getting in the way of a bulldozer or bit builders to come round Elton Community Hospital and see that the work that's underway. Um, and so that's an offer to, to all of the committee members. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you for your uh, slide as well. Any questions from councillors? Councillor Fahey first. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can you um, advise us as to what impact, of any, um, these changes have had on the QE um, uh, waiting times at A&E? &E? I don't think we can make a direct correlation between this and waiting times in A&E. &E. I think what you can... I think what, what, what we've got is a, a simpler pathway for the hospital staff and discharge because you've got one intermediate care facility. Previously, it was like, well, which, res which, which postcode does this person live in? Well, they live in Greenwich, and they're with a GP here, and this is the location they go to. So you've got one bedded facility, but the main focus has been, through this work, we've been able to invest in our Home First model, which is supporting people in their own homes. And so our Home First offer is much more significant than it used to be. And that's been really helped. And part of that is things like our move towards our kind of virtual wards. And so we've really seen a big increase in our, our support there. The net impact of all that has really helped in flow. However, saying all of that, we know that the QEs often under significant uh, pressure. But I think the key things we've done on, on that side have been things like implementing the new urgent treatment centre. Um, so we've got the new provider there, Greenwich Health, uh, running that service. Um, 
I'm happy to talk about that at another time, but again, offer for a visit. If any of you want to go around, there's a new digital front door, so over 50% of people can log on there. All of those things are about trying to improve the patient experience at the front door of, uh, of the emergency department. Putting in, we've put in live well coaches, and so from we did a trial that, that worked really effectively. So we realised that there's quite a number of people who come to our emergency department who don't really need emergency care, um, and with the live well coaches and that partnership working, we're able to divert people to the more appropriate places and we're going to continue to see those innovations working in partnership with Lewisham Greenwich Trust and our federation uh, to improve those services. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you again for this because it's been really interesting. I know when we looked at the statistics last year, um, it did seem as if we were cutting the cloth very fine um, to the resources. I mean, the day we had uh, our meeting around this with the patient model, there were more people in the beds than would have been under this plan. So it's great to see that the um, what well, seemed like a bit of a, a bit of a gamble on getting the um, discharge beds and the people out uh, into the community quicker. Um, one concern that we did raise um, last time was around the additional communication that might be required between. Oxley's uh, and based in SIGCUP and then talking to Greenwich officers who might be you know, coordinating that care and back into the home and whether this would make it more complicated for people dealing with different authorities in different parts of the southeast. Is that something that's been a concern at all? No, we've got very active kind of patient flow roles who work to support that and our hospital integrated discharge team um, and so I actually think it's made it slightly easier because we used to have this, well, who can go to Eltham? Who can go to Meadowview? How do the two things work? But often both sites had some spare capacity, but then it was used for flex beds, which weren't the appropriate people. So we were then getting clinical quality issues at the intermediate care beds where they were having people who didn't really need those facilities. So then there was a mismatch in need and and staffing. So all, a lot of those issues have now been resolved. So, I mean, that's my perspective as I hear it, but I'm happy for to hear from uh, Duncan you might have a, a, a view from from as a kind of HP lead yeah so I'm, I'm a physio by background and I um, uh, in a previous role uh, ran therapy services at LGT so I mean on both questions really you, you definitely see uh, in the QE and into Greenwich and into Bexley some really fantastic home first type principles and pathways um, and of course you get the benefit from um, uh, both across Meadowview and uh, you're exactly right, Neil, how you've said it, that, and actually that there was this tussle in the past, I think, between which site might be appropriate and, you know, what are the, what were the referral criteria to each of those units. Um, but the teams are all used to working together, aren't they? They're very collaborative teams and working across those boundaries and actually oftentimes you would have Greenwich patients at Meadowview previously. Um, and so they're all very, I think, developed pathways. So. And you definitely, from an acute flow perspective, you definitely see that there are less patients with, who might be kind of, um, bed blocking is not a very nice term, isn't it? But you're, you know, patient, the patient flow is there but when you've got these developed pathways, um, but notwithstanding that, as you've said, pressures on ED are exceptional at the moment, aren't they? So. Okay, thank you. Um, Francis, did I see a question at the back there? I will do take a public question. You're welcome to come up to the microphone. However, I, I will keep you to a question. If, if you do start making a speech, I will, I will come in. Um, both uh, the questions I'm asking is related to the Eltham Hospital. Um, I'll do the intermediate care. Uh, I have heard recently that people, that's, I've only heard it once, that somebody was waiting two weeks to get into the intermediate care at uh, Bexley. They lived in this area. So I don't know about the capacity for intermediate care. But um, going to medical court, um, are they having regular physio and OT? Because <clears throat> I've used Eltham Hospital on two occasions after major operations, and it was physio every day. There's an OT there. 
there was communal eating, obviously the patients had a choice not to. And it's extremely beneficial. And um, uh, the care at home, I think uh, this discharge, if they don't have the good follow-up of physio, then I, I personally think it does, doesn't enhance the improvement of, of continuing the, the lifestyle, because the, the optimum is to get to back to where they possibly were on year. So that's the question about um, the, the bed situation. The second point is on the digital. Um, the companies who's running the digital, uh, the MRI, etc. Is it a private company or is it? Is the, I know all the all the equipment that comes in is private because it's made private. But is the running of it run by a company or is it run by? Is it the NHS who's got the ownership and or the planning? And what is the responsible? How quick do results get out? Because I was at a patient's reference group recently at my GPs, and there seemed to be some delay in getting results back. So it's the results, and the, and also is are they doing data about qu uh, quantity and quality and results, and especially involving the GPs because they've got a lot of um, obviously the most up to date information. Okay, thank you. So if I answer the first question, which is around, uh, well, there is daily physio and OT at, at Meadowview. In fact, they've been able to enhance the, the therapy support for all the patients there because they've been able to bring the staff together daily, yes. So it's better. It's even better than it used to be. Um, so, so that's there. But I, I'll hand over to Natasha or Duncan around the other questions around uh, equipment and who runs it. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you for your question. So in regards to the assets, so the MRI machine, the CT, etc., yes, they will be owned. They are assets that will be owned by Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, so owned within the NHS. We, as Duncan explained earlier, we our aspiration and our ambition is to have NHS workforce, so NHS staff working on that equipment, using that equipment, and delivering services. But facing the reality of, of NHS workforce shortages, um, not just in South East London, um, we are exploring and those initial conversations are underway on how we might work with the independent sector or, or agencies. But the assets themselves are owned by Lewisham and Greenwich and will be owned by them. If um, the staff is limited and if the working you know, this goes back to the whole issue about staff and conditions, etc. But if the the conditions for staff who have been trained in the NHS, they've, we've, you know, they're all trained and worked in the NHS. If they continuously being employed by the private sector, then we have it affects the NHS. I'm just saying that that point. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. Um, Thank you very much, Neil, Duncan, Natasha. That was a really excellent item and a very good presentation to have received. And thank you very much for coming this evening. Okay, so we will move on to item number five, which is uh, a report on prevention, uh, particularly looking at the 100-day cardiovascular challenge. Uh, cancer screening in tobacco and vaping. And I believe uh, Steve is leading this item. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. And I'm joined by my colleague, Wendy, who is our, our smoking expert um, and has also been involved in some of the work we've been doing to try to improve um, uptake of cancer screening. Um, so I know you, you don't want um, uh, long uh, introductions because people have had the report. So we'll just we'll give a, a, a sort of few key points um, by way of introduction, if, if that's OK. Um, so first of all, um, you, you asked for a report covering those three areas, if you, as you've just said. Um, 
and uh, obviously prevention, there's lots of different sorts of, of prevention. So the, these are, th are three particular issues um, and they, they're kind of connected by the fact that they pertain to two of the biggest causes of preventable early mortality for, uh, for the country as a whole and for our populations in Greenwich, which are cancers and cardiovascular diseases, so heart, heart disease and stroke chiefly. Um, so in terms of the cancer screening, as you'll, as you'll see in the report, um, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, impacts in, in terms of the prevalence and outcomes from cancers are for breast, bowel, lung, and cervical cancers. Three of those uh, cancers we have well-established screening programs for, which are breast, bowel, and cervical, um, run by the NHS, commissioned by the NHS, so they're not ones that local public health um, have responsibility for, but we obviously have a, an interest in them and how well they're meeting the needs of our, of our population. Um, <clears throat> As, as you'll be aware, early detection of, can of cancers is really critical uh, to support the best possible outcome. So the sooner that we can find a cancer, the sooner that treatment can be started and the better the prospect in terms of, of the outcomes for the patient. And screening is a really effective tool to try to find cancers as, as early as possible, uh, you know, usually before people have any symptoms so they wouldn't be taking themselves um, to the GP because they wouldn't they they wouldn't uh, have a, have any concerns. Um, there's also a new lung uh, cancer uh, program that uh, is is going to be rolled out nationally. We were part of a pilot uh, that happened last year in Greenwich, uh, which is particularly targeting people who have been smokers at some point in their lives, uh, which is the biggest risk factor for for lung cancer. So that's a really welcome additional. Uh, program um, sort of add into the into the armory and particularly for lung cancer the earlier you find it it's it's absolutely critical because um, a late diagnosis of lung cancer has a very very poor prognosis it's it's one that it's really critical that we find um, as early as possible in terms of how well the the main cancer screening programs are performing in in terms of uh, coverage and, and uptake for our populations you'll see there's some data in in the report uh, cervical screening updates just over 65 percent uptake um, bowel is about 63 breast is about 53 so really significant room for improvement there um, all of them took a bit of a dip during the pandemic breast screening took the biggest dip during the pandemic and it seems to be taking longer to kind of get those numbers back up again so um, breast cancer screening is is really critical and uh, we Wendy will will um, talk in a minute about some of the things that we've been doing um, locally to try to address that so the report has a, a few uh, of the things that have been happening around um, around screening to improve uptake um, but I'll, I'll hand over to Wendy just to give a little bit of detail on some some of the more innovative work we've been doing around breast cancer screening Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Um, as Steve said, we're very aware of the need to improve uptake of breast screening for the reasons that um, Steve's just said. So we've done a lot of work looking at the data and insights and looking at who has been taking up their screening and then who hasn't been taking up their screening. And we know that subgroups of like black and minority ethnic groups, people living in deprived areas and residents also with learning difficulties and severe mental illness are lower amongst the people that have taken it up. So you might be aware that last year um, we had a informal health and wellbeing board where we focused specifically on screening. And after that we formed a cancer focus group where we wanted to really get to grips with the data and the information how we're going to do this so we were really fortunate as well after that we put in a bid to South East London Cancer Alliance and we um, achieved some funding which we're now using to um, develop a local campaign and really we're applying principles of behavioural science to this campaign so we're really looking at the reasons why women haven't taken up breast screening and trying to look at the barriers and also the motivations behind why women do take it up. And then the campaign is going to be addressing a lot of those barriers. So we've undertaken like structured interviews 
with clinicians and receptions and community workers and social prescribers that are all supporting screening. And from that, we developed like a, um, a survey, which we um, sent through to local communities. And we actually had a fantastic response. Over 200 women took part in that survey. From all of that insight, we're now at the point of doing a behavioral science um, approach where we're looking at all of the barriers and designing a campaign that is really around addressing those barriers to uptake in the screening. So we'll be having a digital campaign and assets um, and adverts, but also recognising digital inclusion. So we'll be do looking at very bespoke messaging in letters and text messaging to women that have yet to be screened. So we are planning that campaign we're hoping to test it very soon and it will be launching in March so we'll be able to come back and hopefully feed back to you when the campaign's been running and some of the results of that but it's really exciting to have support from the Cancer Alliance funding and this is really a way of trying to decrease health inequalities around screening because like Steve said the evidence is so strong for us to have early detection for breast screening great results if we can find breast screening as early as possible so thank you shall we go and cover the other two and then take questions on on all of them or uh, yes so I've in introduce what you wish to and then we'll take okay. questions of the whole bunch all right so uh, we'll, we'll go on to say a few words on smoking that's Wendy as um, you can see from the um, report, smoking is still um, the most single cause of preventable ill health and, and death in the country. And we still, unfortunately, have 75,000 deaths um, in um, England every year from um, tobacco-related um, deaths. It accounts for 500,000 admissions to hospital a year um, as well. So the impact of tobacco and smoking is still huge. We've you know, achieve so much in this country through brilliant legislation and uh, tobacco treatment services. We've gone from when I started, John will remember me from many moons ago in health authority days, um, where we had smoking prevalence of, you know, 30, 40% of the population, and we're now down to sort of 12% um, percent prevalence. But the smokers we've got left in our communities are the ones with, you know, very complex needs high numbers of people with mental health issues, people from deprived backgrounds in certain communities. So we need to do a lot more targeted work with those smokers to support them. Um, in the report, I just focused on a few of our areas where we've been doing targeted work. So one around patients, COPD patients, where we've seen great improvements with training from the hospital staff and teams into tobacco treatment. We've always had quite a large problem and poor outcomes around smoking at time of delivery, so very high numbers of pregnant women in Greenwich smoking through a very extensive period of quality improvement and working with LGT maternity. We've seen a really big improvement in our smoking prevalence amongst pregnant women, so that's been a really big achievement for a lot of hard work and training and supporting the team to do a lot of interventions with pregnant women that smoke. Um, and we've also done lots of work, as usual, around campaigns, public-facing campaigns, Stoptober, um, and um, what was the other project? Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, with um, also around working with Oxleys around um, mental health service users as well, because again, we know we've really got high smoking prevalence within though, that cohort of population. Um, I don't. I can go on to talk about vaping as well. So. Um, obviously, with the smokers that we've got left, we want to be working with them around harm reduction. We want to be um, rolling out our campaign, which is, um, you may have heard of it, it's Stop um, Swap to Stop, it's hard to say. Um, so we want to, for those smokers that have never accessed um, Stop Smoking Support Tobacco Treatment before and those that have never really had successful quit attempts, we're wanting to move those smokers from smoking to vaping because we know... Um, it's now approved by NICE, NICE Guidance and lots and lots of other um, medical authorities that it's 95% safer than smoking, so we want to be moving people onto vaping. You'd probably be very aware of the news and media um, focusing on young people and vaping and the concerns around that. 
Um, Professor Chris Whitty is very clear that if you smoke, we want you to vape. But if you don't smoke, don't vape. And so we don't want young people to be vaping, and we're doing a lot of work around supporting schools and youth settings around that. But we do want smokers to switch to vaping. So it's very much an adult cessation aid rather than a fashion accessory, which unfortunately it's become. So the same things that we've learned about a very extensive period of time around what we've done around smoking and to protect young people from smoking, I strongly believe we've got to do the same thing with vaping and make it less attractive, less affordable, less marketed. So um, that is what I want to be carrying on working. And the government, um, you'll be aware, had a um, consultation out um, before Christmas looking at all of the plans to become a smoke-free generation by 2030. And Steve and I were very much supporting some of the principles in that. So um, vaping and protecting young people from vaping is part of that consultation. So we've yet to see the results of that consultation, but it had a very, very big uptake of responses from that consultation. So thank you. And just finally on the um, cardiovascular disease 100 day challenge. Um, so as I said, um, cardiovascular disease along with cancer are the two biggest causes of avoidable mortality for our populations. Um, and you'll see in the report, every 21 hours, someone in Greenwich dies of, a, of heart disease or stroke. So um, you know, if you look at uh, our, our mortality figures over the course of a year, a really big chunk of them comes from, um, from heart disease, stroke, and, and cancers. Uh, we have 19,000 people currently known to be living with heart disease in, in the borough, uh, but there will be more than that because not everybody will be diagnosed. Um, so our, the Healthy Greenwich Partnership has, has committed to take um, a range of actions to try to address cardiovascular disease, um, both in terms of sort of prevention and, and better treatment uh, and the inequalities that relate to it. Um, our health and wellbeing strategy, which we brought um, to, the, to the panel um, previously, has a number of priorities that relate to this issue. So the, the focus on, on diet, on physical activity, on smoking, alcohol, um, et cetera. Uh, and the Healthy Greenwich Partnership's also um, been doing some work uh, sort of uh, spearheaded by the ICB uh, around a new methodology called the 100-Day Challenge, um, which is basically about trying to take some of our really important shared um, challenges and do some work in a fairly short space of time, try things out differently, test out innovation, bring people together for a sort of bit of a sprint um, uh, rather than uh, some of the more um, drawn out approaches that we, that we might um, otherwise take, um, just to see whether we can learn from that and, um, uh, and, and find new ways of, of addressing difficult issues. Um, so there was a focus on trying to find un undiagnosed hypertension, so people with high blood pressure um, through um, one of these 100-day challenges. Um, which uh, uh, brought three different had three different um, branches to it. One of them was working in, in, in with work with employ, employers in workplaces, trying to go to workplaces to to uh, offer uh, workers blood pressures. Uh, there was there was one around. Um, uh, working, uh, going to community events, uh, sort of family events in the, in the summertime, uh, and, and reaching people through through that route. Um, and um, there's been some analysis of the impact of of that. Uh, it it uh, that that short kind of burst of activity identified. Uh, it actually took the blood pressures of 800 people through those those different routes. Um, 10% of those people were found to have uh, previously undiagnosed high blood pressure or very high blood pressure. Um, so they would be referred on to their, their, first of all, they'd have further monitoring to check that that, that was a, a true reflection and not, not a sort of one-off um, uh, reading that didn't represent the, the underlying blood pressure. Uh, and, and then they found 1% um, who had very immediately uh, life-threateningly high blood pressure, so eight people that needed to go straight to A&E because their blood pressure was basically through, through the roof. Um, and I think some of, some of the key learning from, the, from this work is, uh, is that uh, 
you know, to reach people who haven't traditionally come forward to have their blood pressure taken, and it's one of those things that's a bit of a hidden risk. So we don't normally go to the doctor with unless we feel that there's a, you know, something that that we don't know that's going wrong, or we've got symptoms that so we don't normally go. Um, when, when we feel perfectly fine and not often people don't have any symptoms and feel fine but they have got uh, high blood pressure and they, and they don't know it. So sort of key learning around kind of taking the offer of blood pressure which is very easy to do um, out to different settings and to, to people um, and, and kind of not waiting for them to, to come to us. So... <laughs> That's, uh, that's our three um, focuses on, on prevention. Ha happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. We'll speedily go into the questions. Uh, Councillor Bauer. Thank you very much, Chair. A um, couple for you, Wendy, if you would. Um, first of all, you, you referred to the barriers um, f to women who are coming for forward um, for breast screening. I just wanted you to sort of draw out w what they were. And also on the smoking side, when you're directing people to vaping, is there a particular kind of, is there a financial benefit um, as well between cigarettes and vapes? And do you push them to a certain type? Because I understand there's a lot of different ones. Thank you. Thank you. Really good question. Thank you. Um, there are, we've discovered um, a lot of barriers, um, as you'd understand. They sort of range from um, fear, obviously. Um, a lot of women would rather not know. Um, they feel that, um, you know, that cancer is a, is a scary word and thinking that, you know, what's the point? I don't want to know. It's, you know, I'd rather not know. Um, fear of, you know, getting the results, treatment, and, um, yeah, and obviously um, it not being successful, the treatment. Access as well, and timing. Women, um, this is obviously for women that are 50 um, plus, so often juggling a lot and caring up and caring down and getting around to booking the appointment. Um, and not putting themselves first as well, worrying about everybody else and not really seeing it as a priority. Um, we want to do um, more work, obviously, like you said, about the, the difference early detection makes and pushing, pushing that. Um, we also found that some women weren't really aware that it was coming up. And so we recognise that actually doing some work with women that are younger and getting them ready, that when you get to 50, that actually you will get invited and that when you do, that you'd be really, you know, really important to take the screening up. So again, even doing work really a lot younger with young women in schools and colleges and universities, that as you get older, there are important screening and the benefits of taking up that screening. Um, Obviously, people, there was also women who were worried that um, men might be on the unit as well. Um, and so we are looking at making sure that's really clear that it, on the unit there is only female staff that will be in attendance. Um, you can bring someone with you as well and that you can be chaperoned and supported as well. So those were some of the barriers and then we're looking to... Oh, pain. Oh, yes, that's a good one as well, that it would be uncomfortable... Um, heard like you know horror stories from friends or whatever oh, it really hurts and things like that so um, we don't want to mislead women because it is uncomfortable so it's saying that rather than it being painful and but also that it's easy to make your appointment so they're telephone calls but you can book online and things like that so every barrier that we've sort of discovered through this insight we want to try and address some of those in our campaigns in our messaging and the information that we have on a microsite that we want to develop as well for information but um, for women that have been unscreened, like having bespoke messages that come through that address some of those barriers so we're really talking to those women that haven't yet taken it up and your other question was about the range of vapes. Um, yeah, quite right. There are lots available. And the vape shops we found are the ones that uh, the, the staff in those vape shops are really expert to support and advise people on what would be right for them. Um, the popular ones, obviously, at the moment are the disposable vapes. Um, and it really does come down to sort of personal preference. Some, like, heavier smokers... You 
probably have seen like more of their described like uh, like tanks they're called sort of like the bigger devices and things so we encourage um but we've got the swap to stop scheme we have these like we're called starter kits so they would get like a pod type of device and then up to two weeks work of worth of liquid so we can give them to, to smokers for free and then after that they will be purchasing their their own liquid but we advise them to go and speak to like vape sh some of the vape shops to get sort of that support and advice how to use them obviously as we know smoking is extremely expensive this is why we've got also a problem with illicit and illegal tobacco because they know that you know smokers will want to get tobacco cheaper um so you know vape the disposable vapes are obviously very affordable um but we are concerned with things like environmental aspects of that but you know there's a lot of litter now associated with those um single use so trying to look at ways in which all these products can be recycled and sort of longer use vapes as well so it's down to personal preference at the moment obviously there's lots of flavors quite attractive to young people in the way they even name those flavors as well yeah fancy packaging you know sexy names and you know really kind of young friendly exactly what the tobacco industry did for years in trying to attract people into smoking so same it's very similar and effective tactics for young people but what we really need to focus on is supporting smokers to feel um, encouraged and supported to switch. So these are people that probably would never have tried to quit. And we want them to try vaping because from the harm reduction perspective, it's just so much better for them. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. I've yeah. also got some other documentation that we can circulate around sort of myth busting around vapes and stuff so that's really helpful from action on smoking and health produced a really helpful guide so i'm more than happy to share that so you can sort of learn yourself as well a bit more about it thanks thank you uh, councillor hartley thank you chair um th thank you for the presentation um the first question i have is around the 100 day challenge and um I was kind of left um, from the kind of report, which was a comprehensive description of the methodology and uh, gave the results of the trial. I was left kind of thinking sort of, so what really? What's the kind of next? And you've talked, Steve, a little bit about the learnings that have been taken from the trial. Could you just give, me, uh, give us a sense of return on investment, how that's measured for a, 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 just taking this as an example of a public health intervention because you've detailed it so well. What's the kind of return on investment um, calculation that you're able to do and then on this particular example you know one of the hypotheses was about saturating Glinden which kind of caught my eye as a as a catchphrase um, and you know there was two events um, 71 blood pressure readings taken um, are we taking from that that the kind of saturating insert place name here approach isn't the way to go yet kind of what have we learned what we're we going to take away from that particular aspect yeah, um, so I, I guess um, in terms of the, the sort of return on investment part of your, of your question, um, in a way this, uh, this methodology is, is kind of maybe not, not so much about thinking that we're going to solve undiagnosed hypertension through in 100 days, but more about trying to identify if through working in different ways and different partnerships, there are promising practices that we can exploit a bit further down the line. Um, and in fact, we, had, we have previously done a much bigger piece of work around um, trying to find undiagnosed hypertension, where we actually tested 10,000 people through a roadshow that Charlton Athletic Community Trust did. Um, so one, one of the thing, and, and found um, an equivalent number, you know, probably a similar sort of percentage of people with high blood pressure, so a vastly different scale to, to some of this. So we, we do have the ability to kind of compare and contrast, and also we know how much we spent on that 
one that tested 10,000. I don't actually know what we spent on this 100-day challenge because it, it wasn't us that in, initiated it. It's come through um, some ICB funding. Um, so actually, it's quite a, be quite an interesting thing for us to um, explore a bit further. Um, external consultants were brought in to kind of drive the, um, the, pro the project. So we can have a look at that and see um, well, I, I suspect it might have cost more than the, the, the cost of the, the work that we did that um, found 10,000. Um, yeah, but. well, it would be fascinating to see that. <laughs> I suppose as well, separate, I understand the point, the return is really the learning, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But, but the actual activity, taking out the consultants and the 28 people in a room and all that good stuff, um, the actual activity of going to those employers of manual labourers, um, saturating the linden. I'd be really fascinated to understand that a bit more if you could share that kind of informally. That would be yeah, great. yeah, yeah, very, very happy to. I think the, the other thing just to say on, um, on hypertension is it's one thing going to where people are taking their blood pressure, finding that they've got high blood pressure. It's another thing that then translating into action that actually sustainably reduces somebody's blood pressure. So they then have to potentially take action in terms of their sort of health behaviours. But we really need people to be considered in terms of medication. And there's a big drop off um, from you know somebody telling you in a in a community event that you your blood pressure seems a bit high to them then and actually ending up in their gp practice and being uh, prescribed antihypertensives so that's all part of the mix as well uh, otherwise we you know if, if if it doesn't result in that we're probably wasting our time and money Thanks. And on the saturating linden part, you know, are we going to, what have we learned? It doesn't feel like that bore fruit in this trial uh, in the nicest possible way. Uh, is it the approach? Are we going to kind of move away from that? Any learning there? Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect the, the sort of the, the, the phrasing was saturating Glyndon, but the reality was probably not saturating Glyndon um, by the numbers. I, I, I wasn't myself very directly involved in it, but I can, I can get that there's, there's more um, than we've put in this report here. Very happy to share, share with you, um, Councillor Hartley. Councillor Bakken. Hello. Um, just about the 100-day challenge again. Sorry if I miss this. Um, but with the um, with the staff who take the blood pressures, are they then trained to deliver some kind of like bit? I know I don't know how successful this would be, but a bit of like intervention about you know improving if someone does have high pressure about improving their diet, exercise, etc. To try and get something across then, or at least let them know the importance of maintaining a normal blood pressure. And then my second question is, um, I guess it's, it is more, maybe more of a question to you with cervical screening, but also breast screening in, in, P, in um, trans men who still, who have breasts um, and need to go for that screening. Um, and I know from kind of research that take up is often low in that population. So how are they targeted in kind of a, a sensitive, uh, a sensitive manner? Thank you. So, yeah, in terms of the 100-day challenge, the people who actually went out and did the blood pressure um, tests were people who, would, who were already experienced in doing that and knew how to have the conversations with people about um, uh, what, what, you know, what to say to them, what to advise if they are found to have high blood pressure. Um, so a lot of the partners that were drawn into the 100J challenge were people who, who might have access into those different settings, who, you know, who, who work in some parts of Glyndon or, or wherever it is. But the actual interventions were you know, people brought in, uh, probably some of the same people who did our, our bigger um, uh, programme through Charlton Athletic Community Trust, um, who did that, that major outreach work. So, yeah, yes, I think is the answer to that bit of the question on the breast screening. It's a brilliant question, and I am i don't know the answer, but I'm going to go and look into it. And I'll, is that OK to look? Because I think it's really important, and it hasn't come up in any of our sort of insights and the, any of the research that I've seen, but it's really brilliant. So I'm going to 
have a look in and I can get back to you on that. But as well, in terms of your blood pressure question, when we did the British Heart Foundation 10,000 blood pressures, it was delivered by Chart and Athletic Community Trust as part of Live Well. So exactly what you said in terms of that intervention opportunistically, they are able to then talk to people about all those things that you've said and refer them into other services as well. So that was done at scale for all those 10,000 blood pressures. All of that whole person approach was taken as well as the blood pressure. Thank you. Councillor Fahey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for the report. It's clearly evident that the, the work of um, public health continues unabated and perhaps growing rather than becoming of, uh, of a lesser issue, really. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on the issue regarding vaping. <clears throat> um, I had the opportunity of jumping on a bus recently, uh, which was an after-school bus, and I thought I was joining a vaping party uh, because everyone on the bus uh, were school kids and were actually vaping. So my question really is, the work that you're doing is fine, but is there a link between um, what schools can do in terms of promoting um, the challenges uh, around vaping and uh, how effective that can be really in the longer term? Thanks. You happy for me to take? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Fahi, for that question. Um, yes, there are, and we have been um, proactively um, asked by schools for our support around this. So we have um, gone into schools, like my team have gone into schools and um, presented at heads um, meetings and PSHE um, staff within secondary schools to support them. There's quite a lot of resources that have been developed now to support schools around lesson plans and things and helping them as well with their kind of discipline around that if someone's, you know, caught vaping, so to speak, and supporting them. There's been a lot in the media around, you know, young people being addicted to vapes and hospital admissions and things like that, but that's, again a lot of media hype on a very small number of hospital admissions that have come in from vapes. But very much as I said, it's a brilliant marketing campaign that has been done by the vaping and behind the scenes, some of the tobacco companies that own some of the vaping company um, companies a while back. Um, very sophisticated advertising and promotion. It's been extremely successful to get a lot of young people seeing it as the core new thing so very much carrying on working with schools to support them with it and um, yeah and also like I said um, earlier about the consultation that, that, that has taken place in ways in which we can look to legislation to protect young people so really what's been really successful with smoking is obviously strict legislation age of sale increase you know Years ago, it was 16 that you could buy cigarettes. It moved to 18. You know, to buy vape products, you are meant to be 18 years old. Um, I'm working quite closely with trading standards departments. We're doing quite a lot of enforcement work as well to make sure that retailers are very aware of the law and that we are we are doing test purchasing, following up on reports, and also looking at the illicit vaping market as well because labelling and all sorts of legislation around the products is not where it should be. So lots of activity going on to protect young people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions from me. And then the first one is, uh, Steve, I wondered whether you might speak to the question we had from the member of the public around uh, screening for people with mobility issues who are not able to attend in-person appointments. Um, and then I had uh, just a couple of questions on smoking. It's really positive to see that we've gone from a smoking in pregnancy from quite a bad place to being in line with, with the national average. So I just wanted to ask about the new specialist midwife post, whether that's permanent, is that where the funding is for that, is that continuing? Um, outreach into those particularly difficult to reach groups of women who are smoking in pregnancy. Um, and how, it almost sounds a bit of a naive question, but how do we get to zero um, percent? Um, and finally, just uh, with reference to 633, new money coming in in April, do we have uh, 
do we know where that's going? Have we got where exactly where we want to spend this new anti-smoking money and projects lined up for it? Thank you. Um, so on the, um, so a, a member of the public uh, wrote in in advance of the meeting because she'd seen that there was an item on, on cancer screening coming up to the panel, but um, due to her disability, wasn't able to actually come in person. So she asked if we could answer her question. And she also thought it would be helpful for the answer to the question to be, um, uh, to be played back to the to the panel, um, so I, 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 I um, sought an answer from um, NHS colleagues, um, who said that uh, basically most of the cervical screening happens in GP practices, and GPs will will support all women as best they can within the con context of their practice, um, uh, where they have the the necessary equipment for the the kind of investigation that's 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 needed. Um, it's a cervical screening in particular is a, di is a difficult thing to do in a home environment because of the the nature of the of the examination um, uh, and it's it's better done in a proper clinical environment with with proper lighting um, etc um, and so there there are opportunities for people who perhaps aren't able to get to their practice um, to be uh, transported with patient transport to a, a hospital environment where they would also have hoists if that was needed to to support that from from happening uh, but sort of more generally in terms of people with disabilities and and um, cancer screening uh, the the care coordinators that GP practices now have working with them are, are are good people to talk to who can spend a bit of time understanding the issues and and help to um, problem solve what the what the offers might be um, for women in in uh, in or, or uh, in particular circumstances um, uh, the person also asked about uh, the fact that there doesn't seem to be data telling us about um, uh, what the uptake looks like for people with disabilities in terms of cancer screening and that uh, that, that that ought to be rectified so uh, we're, we're also uh, going to uh, get uh, the information about who who can who can try and answer that question we haven't quite got there yet but um, it's, it's basically NHS England's responsibility so it's it, they hold the data they would need to do the interrogation of the data but we're going to try and find out exactly who we can um, connect her to um, Thank you. smoking. Back to me. Thank you for your questions. Um, yes, we've done extremely well with smoking and pregnancy. We were really stagnant on the sort of around 10% for, for a very long time. I've worked in tobacco control for 28 years, and it's always been something that we've really struggled with in Greenwich, so we're really pleased that it's come down. So, yeah, we do um, support a smoke-free midwife, but also... The NHS now funds, as part of the long-term plan, monies um, in house tobacco um, t tobacco dependency staff within LGT. So this is an inpatient tobacco dependent service. So anyone on admission that's um, assessed that they are a smoker will get support whilst they're in um, the hospital, and then that support is transferred when they are discharged out to the community. Um, and part of the answer to one of your other questions about money is, is indeed carrying on investing in support for pregnant women. There's very strong evidence around um, incentive schemes that have been tested out in other parts of the country, such as Manchester, and we are piloting that at the moment within LGT, and it's looking like that's going to be rolled out nationally because it's going so well around supporting pregnant women with incentives such as vouchers and other things that they can use for a baby when it comes and things like that. So that's going down really well. So there's certainly things that we want to carry on investing in. Um, that other ideas that we've got at the moment, we're, within Greenwich, we're part of... Um, South East London Tobacco Dependency Oversight Group, which Steve is co-chair of, and we're working with colleagues from public health and other borough leads um, to come up with a South East London plan as well to make sure that we're maximising impact on um, what we're doing together around tackling tobacco and tobacco treatment. 
um, a couple of project ideas just to give you. He's, he's supporting people in drugs and alcohol services as well to swap to stop because we know high, very high prevalence of smokers within drugs and alcohol services. So looking at increasing support around vaping with those client groups, mental health. And also recently really interesting pilot of um, within ED departments that have happened. So when people are sitting around for a very long time waiting in A&E, um, there's been a really successful pilot that they have actual tobacco treatment in ED and get given um, vapes whilst they're there and support and advice. And it's had some really su huge success. So we're looking at wanting to replicate that in South East London across our six boroughs as well with some of the investments. So working with LGT to try and make that happen post April. So, And how do we get to zero? Well, I've always said I'm trying to put myself out of a job over 28 years. That hopefully at one point we will have such a low prevalence that I'll feel that we've... Um, We've achieved that. Actually, the smoke-free generation and smoke-free London will come in if we get to less than 5%. So that is defined as then we have you know, we will have a smoke-free generation. So that is our target to get to less than 5%. And I think we've got to carry on doing what we're doing, really, really you know, continuing with the legislation, looking at protecting young people. So we've been really successful with numbers of smokers you know young people starting to smoke it's can you know it's it's been falling for years and it's still low um and helping the smokers that we've got now to quit in the, all of those settings that i've talked about so and government policy is really important around price and smoke free areas like we said we change you know where you know we had smoke free policies and pubs so all of that comes together as tobacco control com comprehensive plan really so Thank you. Thank you. We have one final question from Councillor uh, Bauer. Thank you, Chair. You sort of answered what I was going to um, ask, but maybe you could say a little bit more. I just um, wanted to flag up that I feel really depressed when I walk into um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital with all the smokers at the front, so you kind of walk through this fog of, um, of smoke. Um, the, the person who is supporting those smokers, um, are they self identified or how to, how do they get to the smokers to support, to support them it's a very good question so if you walk into qe and on on the site it's got signs everywhere to say we're a smoke free site and it is something that not just you know lgt struggle with all hospitals struggle with this I've recently been to Darrant Valley in, in, in Dartford and it's exactly the same people standing underneath the signs saying don't smoke smoking um, but we are dealing with people that, you know, have an addiction and during the hospital visit, you know, it can be very stressful as well. So the, the long-term plan money is for supporting an inpatient service. So again, that would be for, for people that are in hospital. Lots of people that are standing outside can be outpatients or visitors. So we want to be looking at ways in which we're working with the hospital as well around their smoke-free policy and training start more staff and signposting people if they're there as an outpatient um, appointment like i said doing projects like it within ed as well to offer vaping and support them through that but also maybe outpatient appointments as well so they can have those conversations with people as well so it's an you know an ongoing struggle they used to have like shelters years ago then they got rid of the shelters obviously you've got large staff workforce there as well so it's where staff go for um, you know, smoking breaks as well. So, um, so, but we're continuing to work with the hospital. But it is a challenge. It is a challenge. One, one of the things that I know um, our colleagues in trust are, are thinking about is extending the role of the tobacco treatment service in hospitals to actually go around and talk to the people who are standing outside and maybe do a, a, a swap to stop um, intervention with them and offer them a, a, a kit. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I think it's worth just mentioning that the government has a, uh, a national scheme whereby local authority um, stop smoking services can, or public health teams can apply to get free um, a supply of vaping kits because they're really trying to saturate um, uh, vaping kits amongst uh, current smokers. Um, 
Uh, so we've 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 got a, a stock of those, and we will we will continue to apply for more and draw down more. So that isn't costing um, the sort of Greenwich pound any money, but it does mean that we can try new ways of trying to get people to to switch, um, uh, which would be you know be great if we could crack the hospital smoking issue, which has been so dreadful for so long. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'm going to close this item. So I do thank you for your time and your excellent presentation and for uh, your contributions on the questions. Um, and have a lovely evening. Um, whilst we're setting up for item number um, six, which is our final large item, I'm going to propose that we take a two-minute bathroom break um, whilst we change over. If everybody's happy with that. Francis, you have already participated in public questions. Okay, I am moving on to introducing this item, which is the Greenwich Suicide Prevention Strategy 23 to 28. Uh, Robin, do you wish to speak to it before we head to questions? Just, just say very, very quickly before I hand over to Robin, who, who's led on on this work. Um, that this is the the second suicide prevention strategy that we've uh, that we've had in Greenwich. It was a, agreed at uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board in December of last year, so it's sort of fairly new. And, and Robin will just describe um, some of the key elements of it and the next steps. Thank you. Um, would you like me to be quite brief? I'm aware that uh, the hour is fairly late, um, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of a reminder of kind of the context for this work um, and a very quick overview of where we've got to, how we got there and, and, and where we're, we're heading. Um, so uh, I suppose like kind of big picture, um, suicide is a relatively small contributor to our, our, our deaths locally, around about 1% of the deaths that we see averages about 15 a year with, with significant fluctuation due to small numbers. Um, but as I'm sure many of the, the committee will be aware, a uh, very, very sort of significant impact, um, disproportionately impactful deaths, um, often early um, and particularly traumatic for friends, family, witnesses, um, and, and clinicians and professionals. Um, in terms of our local picture, uh, we have not seen a rise in deaths by suicide. Um, at any point recently, and, and especially in response to the pandemic, which has been a, a sort of concern across um, the, the, the system and, and, and globally, I guess. Um, we have not yet seen that um, and hope, hopefully won't. Um, but what we have seen uh, is an increase in a lot of associated issues. Um, so certainly uh, increases in... Um, uh, it, well, survey data showing increase across the population in mental health problems and then system and clinical data showing we've had a, around about a 50% increase in referrals into our secondary care system, which happened around the beginning of the pandemic and has not fallen. Um, that is now married to uh, a situation where we've got the cost of living crisis um, appearing, um, we've had international events um, and a number of uh, uh, sort of scenarios developing which evidence suggests are likely to be risky around suicide. Um, so that was kind of the context for which the new suicide, in which new suicide prevention was, um, strategy was developed. Um, and I think that's played in a lot to what it looks like. Um, we went through um, a fairly large stakeholder engagement um, process and, and, and event. And a lot of the feedback that we got was that um, in contrast to our previous suicide prevention strategy, which was very focused, I would say, on, on some um, narrow set of well-evidenced actions. Um, and you'll, in the cover paper, you've got uh, an update on, on progress around them. Um, stakeholders really wanted to see something which uh, captured the breadth of factors um, and issues um, and interventions that are relevant to suicide prevention. So what we've done is, is, is we've, take, we've taken that feedback, the evidence, um, the national and local evidence and feedback from stakeholders, 
uh, and put together a high-level framework for action over the next five years, which does represent, we hope, a lot of um, the con contributor and relevant factors um, around suicide risk. Um, so that has um, uh, resulted in nine high-level priorities, which you'll uh, have in front of you um, that range from tackling stigma and um, action to promote um, well-being in communities, um, ident identification of people at risk and provision of support for them, a particular focus on children and young people with mental health. That's coming both from concern about um, suicide um, and self-harm among young people, but also the role of early life in determining um, mental health across the life course. Um, engage, com community engagement to support early intervention um, and reduce the risk of mental health crisis and suicide. Uh, the service piece, um, uh, so what actions we can take within our primarily mental health services but also elsewhere um, to reduce risk. Um, tackling means, um, means of suicide, uh, um, uh, addressing self-harm, work around improving our intelligence and insight um, and the sort of postvention, as it's called, support for people who've been bereaved or affected by suicide. So it's quite a broad range of actions. It, un underneath those, you will find um, the existing work or um, imminent work that have been identified um, and uh, proposals about what um, actions and um, uh, priorities for, for, for improvement would be. Um, we are reconvening um, a refreshed suicide prevention partnership, um, which will be happening uh, in the first half of next month to start moving from this very broad set of uh, all very important, but um, uh, some areas which uh, are being taken forward by other parts of the system um, and really uh, understanding where we're going to drive new action as part of the suicide prevention strategy, who's going to take that forward, how we're going to monitor that, how we're going to be accountable, um, and to where. So certainly the Health and Wellbeing Board, but possibly Healthy Grange Partnership and other places as well. Um, uh, yeah, I think. Are you happy to move to questions from there? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, the, the final point was about um, the, the building relationships with uh, a, a sort of grassroots um, uh, suicide prevention um, coalition, which was another piece of feedback that we took on board. So, um, yes, absolutely, please. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Um, I'd also just like to mention uh, thank you to uh, Councillor uh, Olin Begby, who uh, highlighted this item and I think has been quite involved with, in the development of it, so I think that's worth noting. I'll start with Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for uh, introducing the report. And, uh, yeah, the, the strategy itself is, is very clear and um, it was really a useful uh, kind of digest on the new approach. Um, I've just got one question, which is around the Greenwich Suicide Prevention Partnership. There's a helpful grid that explains uh, all the different partners involved. Um, and it just felt to me like uh, kind of notable by its absence in the, in the strategy is the private sector, um, particularly given the key role that um, employers and the work, the work setting plays in identifying uh, opp you know, opportunities to intervene early to prevent um, suicide. And I just wondered if you could speak to that. You know, you might be able to reassure me that the private sector are engaged, they're just not on this diagram. You know, what are we doing with employers, I guess, in particular? Um, so you're, you're right that we haven't yet invited any uh, private sector uh, stakeholders into the, into the partnership. Um, that's not uh, a desire to avoid um, uh, exploring the, the role of the private sector. Um, and it's, it's something I've actually <laughs> done um, uh, as part of the uh, previous suicide prevention strategy. Um, we will be looking at what the most effective ways to, um, to engage and, and, and support that, that sector. Uh, as you will all know, Greenwich has got um, a lot of very small employers. Um, uh, and the, the big ones are quite dominated by the public sector. 
so we need to find a way that works for Greenwich, um, certainly trying to make uh, training um, available and visible, so looking at the sort of um, um, Greenwich Business uh, Forum, I've probably forgotten the right terminology for it. Chamber of Commerce too, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that probably that's going to look like um, various places in the work plan where that's a stakeholder we need to communicate with. That said, you know, we, we could look at inviting somebody like chairman of the um, chairperson of the Chamber of Commerce or something into that process. Um, yeah, yeah, it's certainly important, particularly, I would say, um, around, so we, an issue here, not to go off into the weeds, but suicide is a predominantly male phenomenon. It's a predominantly white male phenomenon. They're one of the bits of our population that we find most difficult to engage. Um, it, you know, also a, a non-religious phenomenon, um, if, you, if you read that. So it, it's actually a section of population that's really uninvolved in a lot of structures within society. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think I will, I will certainly try again with um, what we can do around uh, kind of like hardware shops and, and, and you kind of wixes and places like that, which we've never managed to get to engage with um, mental health um, promotion and, and, and or specifically suicide prevention stuff. Um, yeah. Councillor Fahey. Thank you, Chair. I think we're all very keen in, um, in producing a report and thinking, well, we've done our job and that's it, really. And uh, I'm, my comments are perhaps around being a critical friend, really, but it seems to me that <clears throat> we have uh, a policy and a strategy. But in effect, um, we know, for instance, uh, major problems around young people on mental health issues, lack, lack of resources and support for them, how do we deal with that? Um, we have issues around uh, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, many of whom over the winter period as we sit here are currently sleeping on the streets in Greenwich and elsewhere. Um, and um, we have people, a lot of people sleeping on the streets uh, and in some respects are dealt with in silos. Um, in many respects, uh, if they present themselves for housing, they get a number to ring, which is not a borough number, it's a number outside the borough, uh, for support. Uh, and they may be housed or they may not. So the point I'm making really, um, we need to look at individuals holistically uh, rather than looking at them in silos. So therefore, um, would you be aware um, of those vulnerable people that are referred uh, by agencies and others to the council and are you able to pick up those individuals and see what their support, if any, might be uh, and needs to be, I guess, really, in the short and long term. I don't see any evidence to uh, give me much reassurance uh, that the holistic approach is being developed. I apologize if I got that wrong. No, um, uh, so to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly, um, are you asking about how people who- Sorry, John, can you turn your microphone off? Big pardon, sorry. Um, people who may be at risk of suicide or may be at risk of other bad outcomes are identified across the system and, and signposted towards support. Well, one relates to support. the other. If they're vulnerable, living on the streets, for instance, mm -hmm. they have a number of problems. Mm -hmm. Are those the problems identified when they present themselves? I know not. Right, um, so I think there's probably like a broad answer to that in terms of kind of what our strategic approach is, um, but maybe less actually specific to people living on the street, but, but more generally in terms of the range of um, our population who come into contact with different parts of the system. We absolutely want to try and have a consistent understanding and offer to those people, which is what the Make Every Opportunity Count um, program and approach is about, and, 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 and 
um, supporting <coughs> staff across the system to recognise different types of need and know where to get those people for support. I think the homeless, rough sleeping population is probably a bit of an exception. That's quite specialist um, support and, and, and teams that work around that that will be plugged into more intensive kind of offers. Um, and uh, but, but there is, there's a whole issue at the moment, to be honest with you, around homelessness and um, our work here because our primary localised method of um, uh, identifying deaths by suicide does not include people who are homeless because the system is linked to home postcodes and that's been a challenge we've been working on. There is a new data system coming in which is going to sweep up a whole load of data around homeless people which will include uh, mortality and, and, and suicide so that should help with that. I suppose I'm, I'm not fully abreast of what the, um, the homeless teams uh, offer is like and, and, and what their, their, um, their kind of approach is. I would expect it to be quite an intensive one compared to the rest of the system, um, but obviously like an extremely challenging, challenged population um, um, with a lot of really significant um, needs. And I don't know if there's anything you want to stay, Steve, from. I, I guess it's... I think your, your point about make every contact count, we, we, we do um, offer training and support for frontline people and those who come into contact with people who might be in crisis. Um, and and some, some of the training that, that Robin um, coordinates is, is about helping people to, uh, to deal effectively with those, those kinds of situations which have, have increased since the, since the pandemic. Um, we, we are also doing quite a lot through the drug and alcohol um, uh, people in my team um, around uh, the, the homelessness and rough sleep population where there's a, obviously a significant overlap um, uh, with, uh, with people needing support around those services and there's actually some new government money that's come down and there may therefore be more opportunities in terms of increasing the, the kind of offer um, around that to, to sort of plug this work in, in there. So um, it's, a, it's a good challenge, John, and, and something we can, we can have a look at. Thank you. I think that's quite an extraordinary gap around names and addresses in the statistics, but we'll come on to that. I want to go to Councillor Rahman first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just looking at the stats and uh, it's what you've kind of highlighted about kind of the majority, majority of those in danger of, of, of suicide are white male uh, between 40, 50, um, non-religious, obviously not necessarily saying they're all related here, but in different charts, that's kind of what it's, what it's, what it's highlighted. But I guess, in, and it's quite... I guess what you mentioned is quite tricky getting into those groups and getting to speak to them. So that, that is quite an interesting challenge, I guess, because um, I know there's, there's a lot of campaigns through sports and stuff, especially through football, to try to reach men. But obviously, the group of men that we're trying to target might not be the ones that watch football. Or, um, but in terms of lessons from other communities, maybe, other groups, is there a way to look at why the number is so high in, 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 in this specific um, group over others? Um, are there things in place? One, why is it easier to get into those groups? And two, are there things that we can learn from those other groups that can be, you know, um, used across in a way? Um, so if, if the question is about ways of engaging um, and, and, and why it's more difficult, um, uh, so I think part of why it's more difficult uh, will be about kind of as I referenced earlier, the sort of social structures that people are plugged into. We know that men in general are less um, compared to women, regardless of, of other factors in their lives. Um, uh, I would suspect that perhaps some of the ethnic difference may be associated with the faith phenomenon, because actually uh, being part of a religious community does come with a whole bunch of social connection um, and, and kind of wider social support. Um, uh, what can we do about it? So, some things. Um, so, so, for example, uh, taking kind of geographical approaches to engagement, which is one of the things that we've really been focusing on. 
um, through the deep engagement program of the pandemic and then now aligning with primary care networks there is a um, this sort of physical location approach which may help a little bit with that reaching people who aren't part of what we call a community of interest um, there is workplaces um, and I think the other thing is that yes it's great to engage with people um, probably what really matters for those groups are addressing the reasons that they may be in crisis it's probably going to be about what our um, uh, kind of housing economic credit supports offer looks like um, you know to, to be sort of very stereotypical about what a middle-aged man who dies by suicide might look like probably divorced or single probably in some sort of like financial or economic pressure either long-term unemployed which you'll see there's strong stats that but that, that's probably the worst but but or having lost you know um lost employment um so uh, you know i think part of the spirit of this strategy is that we don't only think about how do we go in at the last moment and stop that person from dying which i would say is, is a typical sort of approach to, to suicide prevention because it, it really works surprisingly you know um uh, everyone was very frustrated that you can buy two packs of ibuprofen at the same time and it's like how's that going to stop anyone from killing themselves they'll go next door actually works really well um if you you can interfere at the last minute in in suicide often it's successful but we do i think really want here to recognize that actually we need to interrupt the escalator that people are on that brings a very small number of them to that kind of pinnacle of uh, crisis and, and distress where people can die. But actually, that, that is the tip of an iceberg. And um, we've got lots of people who are really deeply unhappy and stressed, and it's for societal reasons. And the, the local authority and its partners is very concerned with addressing that kind of thing, and it's the... the um, the day job of a lot of people and the, the kind of passion of um, leadership. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, question from me, if you will allow it. Um, I particularly wanted to ask about the surveillance systems. So the real-time system for London, uh, just a couple of questions. So how long has this been available? Does it register unsuccessful attempts? Um, how is it impacted by the delays that we've seen in coroner's courts, um, particularly during the pandemic? So to what extent, how is this real time? Um, and I also you mentioned that there's coming online a self-harm surveillance system. I would like to know how that, would, how that works. Um, and the other point that I'd like to make separately is um, regarding one of the themes, which is around reducing means to suicide. But I didn't quite see um, where that really comes out strongly in the strategy, especially when we're looking at the places and that overwhelmingly it's occurring in the home. Um, you know, a lot of places, obviously, we, there's particular spots that are prevalent, railways, etc. cetera. Um, but that didn't seem to be something that was particularly relevant to Greenwich. Thank you. Um, so... Uh I'll try and remember, but we wouldn't get them in the right order. So the London real-time surveillance system, uh, like late 2020, um, no, it doesn't capture um, attempted suicide. Um, uh, how how real-time is it? Uh, a couple of days, um, usually. Uh, it's not affected by coronial processes because it doesn't... Um, it doesn't measure suicides. It measures um, deaths where blue light services have suggested that they think it probably would be a suicide. Um, so it's a real-time suspected suicide surveillance system. Um, uh, I would say, as somebody who like read, reads every single one, I would, I would imagine, I, I, it's hard to imagine that most of them wouldn't end up being um, uh, classified as a, you know, declared a suicide by the coroner. Um, you were asking about self-harm surveillance. Um, 
So that will be about A&E attendances. So not going to tell us anything about the uh, self-harm that doesn't result in somebody needing care. So is, isn't going to measure most of it. Um, that said, you know, arguably this will be a truism, but the evidence about the link between self-harm and risk of suicide does relate to self-harm that's serious enough for people to, um, to need hospital treatment. Um, there's a sort of general understanding, I, I would say, that there are different types of self-harm, um, that uh, the kind of explosion in self-harm um, among younger people may be a different phenomenon to the kind of self-harm that is strongly predictive of suicide. And that gets us into the whole problem about, well, was it self-harm or was it an attempt? And nobody can tell you. Um, uh, but that will be coming online. There's also work um, within local NHS to see whether or not, as well as measuring it, can we improve the experience for people who come in with self-harm and, and put some uh, new staff in, essentially, as a sort of psychiatric liaison um, support. Um, so the last update I got on that was it was uh, still in, in planning, um, but there's funding being uh, drawn from a, a South East London um, suicide prevention pot, which also paid for our suicide bereavement service. So I kind of hope that might, um, that may come to fruition and we at least get some learning from it. Um, in terms of access to means, um, to be honest, I was almost tempted like not to have it <laughs> because we are so constrained in Greenwich because of the nature of our death. It's, it, it's kind of, um, an absolute classic uh, element of suicide prevention. I thought probably best to leave it in, but are things that need to be attended to in that space, primarily um, it, it's medicines management, really. Um, but you, you're, you're right that in this borough, um, mainly people die by hanging, mainly they do it at home. There isn't really much opportunity for us to interfere there. That's followed by by poisoning. Um, and I think we want, uh, and, and also as we get more evidence from the real-time surveillance system, which as well as being more real-time, gives us information it doesn't go into ONS data, which, which comes out the other end very am ambiguous, to be honest, um, and at a very high level, um, looking at, at what kind of uh, tools have been used and, and, and whether we might be able to um, to act on that. We, we, we do then, as like a third, um, third most common, we do have falls, we do have people um, uh, jumping in front of trains. Um, I, I would say at the, at the moment, we probably had somewhere where it's happened twice um, but we're not seeing the kind of uh, high frequency location. Other parts of the country and London, they will have, I mean, you know, wild frequency, obviously, um, the bridges in, in central London. Um, we, uh, train stations do have suicide prevention um, activity there that are driven through network rail and, and other stakeholders who so are really good, I would say, like really, really good. Um, there's reliably Samaritan signage there now and there's really good training programs for staff. We'll definitely keep an eye on it and think about whether there are things we can do, but I would say they're, they're robust. Um, Thank you. It's, uh, I take your point that it's, it's not something that's really as, as applicable in Greenwich as it is elsewhere. At the moment. Yeah. We'll take one final question uh, from Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. I <clears throat> just wanted to build a little bit on Councillor Hartley's point. Um, I, I see that you've drawn a, a, um, a, a point that um, gambling addictions contribute to, to, to suicides. Um, whether you thought about um, working with some of the, the many betting shops that we have in the borough. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be, it would be interesting. Um, I would quite like to know what, what they look like. And we've got, um, 
you know, in terms of whether there's anything that they're already doing. Um, as you've heard about earlier, there's a, uh, an addiction strategy um, now. So there'll be people with hopefully a lot of insight into that and, and, and thoughts on, on how amenable they're likely to be and, and what the opportunities would be there. Um, but yeah, I think it would be uh, like, like some of the, the, the other kind of male-dominated spaces we've talked about, potentially a, um, a fruitful place to try and, try and do some engagement. I think because of the, in the last few years, there's been that kind of pause campaign that they've, they've run, you know, if it, it doesn't feel right, take a break from gambling. They ought to be amenable to it, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, having spent a lot of time reading the, um, the notes um, on these deaths, there is a, a, a challenge, and you know, uh, colleagues working in this space will not be able to tell you much better than me. It, it, like the move to online, um, so you know, we've got secretive gambling. People are doing it on their phones and stuff like that. But I mean, some of them will be going to betting shops, and I think you know, it's a really good idea to think about whether we can we can persuade them to to help us in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've seen no one else wishing to. Uh to participate, so I think I'll close the item there. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for bringing the strategy. It's been, uh, and I appreciate we, we spoke about it at Health and Wellbeing Board as well. But um, thank you for your hard work on this. Okay, councillors, um, the final item is around discussing a uh, work program for next year. Um, we usually arrange a separate meeting for this, usually online, um, which I'm happy to continue to do. All agree? All right, thank you very much. I'll close the meeting.